please welcome Vinod Kosa to the stage. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yep, that button. And the mic. Good evening. So, um, I didn't prepare a lot to say because we're going to try and do this as a Q&A. I want to respond to your questions. Um, let me start by saying a few things. First, uh, digital health is a radical opportunity. Um, there's two classes of things I'm seeing, things that help functions today, and they're very valuable, um, but they are more administrative and support in IT. And then there's companies and efforts that are inventing what I call the science of medicine. New science, new medicine, and your traditional doctor won't recognize what it's about. Uh, both are important. Both offer plenty of startup opportunities. Uh, and in all of these, we'll uh, see great companies being built, which I think is the principal interest of the people here. Um, on my website, uh, I'm just finishing up a paper which started as a three-page blog, but the last version I saw today was 70 pages long. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the process has been every time I say or write something, somebody objects, and then I have to do the research to answer questions. Uh, I may not answer it directly for them, but I always do answer it for myself, and in the process, I add detail. Um, but for those of you interested in the detailed view of what I think about digital healthcare, that paper is probably the best I have to offer. Whether it's right or wrong, I can't tell you. It's highly speculative, it's radical, uh, but it is very promising. If my view is right, uh, most of what doctors do today will be eliminated. Most means diagnosis, most means uh, prescription of care, and most includes monitoring, which basically doesn't happen today. It'll be happen at a fraction of the cost, uh, essentially free, uh, all over the world, um, and e pretty close to equal access for everyone. If I'm right, the single biggest change may be to make the consumer, the patient, uh, the CEO of his own health. The patient or the consumer, and I like to think less of Today's healthcare is more sick care than healthcare, uh, and I hope we go from sick care to well care, uh, at least predictive care. But what the consumer will do is be so much better informed, often better informed than their doctor, that their doctor's rail role will change. Now, many people quote me as saying, oh, just eliminate the doctors and some machine will take care of you. That's not what I intend. Uh, what I do intend is doctors, for example, I don't think you'll rely on a system to make ethical decisions in medicine. Uh, you won't rely on a doctor to be your mentor, uh, on a system to be your mentor or coach through an illness. So the role of a doctor will change radically. Um, I think because of that, who you admit into medical school will change dramatically. I sometimes joke that UCLA film school doctor graduates may do doctor, play doctor better than doctors who are suggested, uh, who are selected more for IQ than EQ. Um, your nurses may do a lot more than uh, what today's median doctor does. But most exciting to me, I think all this will be available everywhere in the world. Uh, most of what I speculate will be wrong, on, but wrong on the specifics and directionally right, I believe. So just because you can't predict the future doesn't mean the present is going to continue. 
It just means you can't predict the future. I believe it's easy to predict directionality. It's hard to predict specifics. And on the specifics, I'll usually be wrong. But that doesn't uh, prevent me from speculating on how it might happen. Why don't I open it up to questions? And I'll take uh, questions from uh, people. So you spoke about healthcare changing. Is now a good time to invest in healthcare, or should we do it in five, 10 years? And if so, why? Well, so it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to run uh, spreadsheets, then five years from now may be a good time. If you enjoy innovation, if you enjoy causing change and enjoy contributing to the development of medicine, now is absolutely the right time. If you think about the fundamentals, a number of things have come together. Um, think about it. Uh, there is more computing power by a few orders of magnitude spent on every decision on what ad to place in front of your web page than is spent on the medical decision your doctor makes for you. Uh, think about it. Which one's more critical? And which one gets more attention, more sophisticated systems, better machine learning? Um, so that's the world we live in today. By the way, my favorite analogy is if Google was allowed to have a driverless car on the road with the same level of errors as medicine, they would be told you can't have a car that has more than one or two accidents a week. That is how often medical errors happen. Most people don't realize that medical errors just in the ICU kill more people every year in the United States than all of breast cancer. It's a way more catastrophic disease than ca breast cancer. So uh, let me go, not go off on that high horse. Um, it's the standard of care, and if somebody wants to ask me more examples, I have a whole boatload of them. But mobile has enabled compute power equivalent to your supercomputer from 20 years ago in your pocket. Sensors have become so cheap that you can have a lot more data. I wore a prototype device recently. Um, you know, when I go to my doctor, and I pay a lot for my doctor, I might get 30, 50 po data points a year. Um, this device I wore gave me 10 million data points a day. Now, my doctor didn't want to see 10 million data points. I'm a very good doctor. Um, this enablement of sensors, mobile computing, and finally, what we are seeing in machine learning and data science is creating a nexus. Um, I like to say a stool doesn't stand on one or even two legs, but when you get three or more, it does pretty well. And I think we are at that transition point, hence the large opportunity I see. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. What are some of your favorite investments to date in uh, healthcare on the consumer side or the data side? Yeah, I don't know if I would call anything my favorite investment, but there's a lot of very significant things that are happening. Some I can't talk about for obvious reasons, but others that are public. So let me give a few examples among the public set of opportunities that are the kinds of things uh, that might be fairly significant. Um, AliveCore is a company that builds an ECG machine into the uh, iPhone case. No big deal by itself. Uh, when it becomes a big deal is if you can take five EKGs a day. Today, if you're a heart patient, uh, you might schedule one, two, or three EKGs a year. 
You get your appointment a month in advance. When you go to the doctor, you may have no heart episode going on. You don't know what you'll be feeling like, what may be happening that day. If you carry an EKG machine in your pocket, and by the way, one of those hospital EKGs overall will bill you $1,000, right? Um, depending upon where you go. If you have an EKG machine in your pocket, you could do five EKGs a day. You could do one when you, when you wake up, you could do one after you eat, you could do one when you're exercising, you could do one when you're not feeling well. Guess what, we already do this for diabetics. They do their blood sugar five times a day. Why shouldn't heart patients do their EKG five times a day? Or continuously monitor their heart rate and their heart rate variability and I could go on. Um, now that's more interesting than just a piece of hardware. But once you have five EKGs a day and millions of EKGs in your database, you can start to do automatic diagnosis. Now you've got a cardiologist in your pocket for free, for a fraction of the cost of one EKG at the hospital, you've got a constant attending cardiologist on you. We've seen the same kind of change that a life core can do for cardiology Ginger IO is doing for mental health, um, and Cellscope's doing for ENT, and then dermatology. And so you can see the trend. Every single specialty is subject to innovation, and there's really fun things to be done in almost every area, and that's why we need more people like you here. That's really interesting. So what about uh, other companies, like non-digital health companies? companies and uh, biology, chemistry, that kind of innovation. So, uh, look, there's innovation happening at every level. From simple patient intake to radical changes in physics and chemistry. One of the new things I've seen that's very, very encouraging is used to be most of the innovation happened around enterprise software or internet mobile or uh, or say um, in semiconductors which has essentially slowed down a lot but much of the talent that knows how to do physics and chemistry is still around and they're starting to work on really interesting things reinventing food is one of my most fun examples we're redoing eggs we're redoing beef, uh, we're redoing salt. Not all sort of heart related, but really fun and really fundamental science. And that's pretty exciting to me. I suspect there's a fair number of PhDs in physics and chemistry uh, who I think will see more and more use. So one of the things that people always ask is, how do they compete as a small startup against these huge incumbents like, um, you know, the insurance companies, the hospital chains that have billions and billions of dollars? So I like to say, how can a hospital chain or a big company compete against an entrepreneur? I just, I just can't see. And if you have that question, then you're not a good entrepreneur. <laughs> So if you had to pick one, and you can't say both, and you can't say it depends, which one is more important from an investment perspective? Improving outcomes or reducing costs? Improving outcomes. No question in my mind. You know, this is an important question. Um, and I spend a lot of time thinking about this kind of question. If your goal is to make the money, make the most money, it may be that reducing cost matters or getting more reimbursement codes matter. I'm much more invigorated by outcomes uh, and I think it's much more exciting, impactful, and it so happens that when you have the most impact, generally, not always, generally you tend to make more money too, it just takes a lot longer. So, I, I think Mission-driven entrepreneurs do better than, than mercenary-driven entrepreneurs. Uh, it just, it takes longer and is a harder road. But it's more fun. 
we keep hearing about healthcare companies, hospitals, payers, wellness companies trying to build digital health technologies themselves when there are so many great innovative emerging companies out there. What do you say to those hospitals and health plans that are trying to do that innovating work? Um, first, I, I think institutions of any size are less likely to be successful uh, as businesses. And if nothing else, they'll reduce the risk for entrepreneurs who can do the same thing. Uh, partnering with institutions like that actually can help. Um, it can get you down the curve. But I'll give you an answer from a related field. Uh, we were the very early investors in Square. And uh, Jack Dorsey did an interview for Wired magazine where he was asked, uh, the company then was about 250 people, and he was asked this question, which is very common. Payment is a very complex area. There's hundreds and hundreds of regulations, all these protocols, these compliance things. It's very hard for a startup to do. And how come you're, you're successful. And you know what his answer was? We didn't hire any of those people who know all that stuff. <laughs> I think he mentioned in this interview that out of 250 people, only five came from the payments business. And that was their salvation. Uh, so they didn't know what they were not supposed to do. Uh, I think it's important. People who know the current system have a lot of experience and can help to a degree, but they bring experience, which is a problem too, because all experience is, is a bias. Some biases are good, some biases are bad for new innovation. Mostly it's more bad than good. And so being free to think from scratch is really important, and that's what great entrepreneurs do very well. So I'm a big fan of inventing from scratch, getting somebody or your on your team from a traditional area, but not letting that determine what you do or what you think is possible. Really critical to reinvent a lot of processes from scratch. Nice. I like that guy. <laughs> uh, what? was the best decision you have made so far in your life and how did you make that decision? Um, the best decision I made was probably the uh, other than who I married. Uh, I want to be politically correct here. Uh, uh, the best decision I made was to come to this country. I, I, was, uh, I was probably 16 when I was reading an article about Intel starting up. And Andy Grove, as a Hungarian immigrant, came to this country to start uh, Intel. And I thought, wow, what a neat idea. It was a really romantic notion that stuck in my head. And so I made my way here so I could start a company. Um, and that turned out to be the best decision of my life, by clearly, other than marrying my wife. <laughs> We'll leave you there. Um, another question. Um, what do you think about... Incidentally, I started dating my wife when I was 16, so it's been a long time. <laughs> Made two good decisions that year. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, um, you know, really important part of entrepreneurship is to not follow the rules. If you follow all the rules, you're going to end up in the same place traditional people end up. Now, I, I, I didn't follow any rules because dating was not allowed when I was 16. Uh, uh, it wasn't accepted. But either culturally you know how to reject rules and have the self-confidence to break them, having thought through, yet not having so much confidence that you ignore real input. It's a very hard thing to do. And I recommend people 
Uh, so to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be both optimistic, obstinately self-confident, and paranoid at the same time. You actually need a schizophrenic personality. Uh, I do recommend uh, people read a book Andy Grove wrote in the 1980s called Only the Paranoid Survive. It has a lot of good tips and a lot of good insight. It's still one of my favorite books on entrepreneurship. So, What do you think about healthcare software in high growth, uh, high population countries like India and China? Do you have any suggestions or tips? Well, uh, uh, to be honest, not a great question, but uh, let me try and answer it. It's, uh, but it's okay, you mispronounced the name, so nobody knows who, you, who asked the question. Uh, nobody will be embarrassed. Um, but look, first, in a country like India, where the economy is growing, and so many people have so little in goods and services, every area where you can provide real innovation, is a good area. Um, because of the dearth of healthcare services, it becomes even more important um, to uh, provide those services, and frankly, it creates even more opportunity for those services um, in India. Having said that, can you charge more? I don't think so. Can you make more money? I don't know the answer. I, um, one thing I do is know what I don't know, and I don't know the Indian healthcare market as well. Uh, what is the main criteria VCs look for while considering healthcare technology startups serving adjacent healthcare markets such as dentists or conventional medicine providers? Right. Uh, let me go back to where was something I said in my opening remarks. Uh, every vertical can be innovated. So, could you build? a good system for dentists? Yes. Um, the question you have to ask is what new thing do you build and bring to the party? Now you can clearly bring administrative systems. We are investors. We are, long time ago we invested in ZocDoc. Really cool startup. Makes it very efficient for the patient to get an appointment. Makes it really revenue generating for the doctor because they can get more appointments, which is what they want. Great system. Not a fundamental contribution to the science of medicine, but it can be done. Um, in dentistry, is there nonlinear changes in practice possible, like I described in cardiology? Probably, but I haven't seen them. Um, I can't imagine where some of the new things like sensors and data science and mobile play a big role in it. Uh, but I suspect uh, every time I say something like that, some entrepreneur proves me wrong and that's, I see a hand up in the back. Uh, that's the greatest thing about my life. Every time I say something, somebody proves me wrong uh, and it motivates somebody to work twice as hard to build their startup, which is great. So we'll, we'll take a question here while you're sorting through your questions. Go ahead. Um, I'd say two things. One, I don't look for validation from other VCs. Uh, <laughs> there are, in fact, one of the biggest problems in the VC business is this huge herd instinct. Um, and so only time you do well in VC is when you have an opinion that nobody else has and you happen to be right. Having an opinion that's different and being wrong doesn't help you either. Uh, uh, so if you imagine the quadrants, there's only one quadrant that's interesting. When you have an opinion, it's ahead of the curve of what others don't believe and you happen to be right. Um, and for that, you have to be very tolerant of being wrong. So of all people, I'm the least em em embarrassed when I screw up. Um, in fact, I worry when I'm not screwing up often enough because it says I'm not taking enough risks and trying enough new things. Um, and and you know, look, 
it's easy to not want to fail, but I actually give a talk called Using Failure as a Tool. It's on our website for those of you who are interested. Because failure managed well is a great tool. It's way more better than planning or studying or pontificating like professors do or McKinsey reports or any of that kind of crap. Uh, Look, my bias is towards people who do things, doers, not pontificators. I've never found a McKinsey report useful ever in my life. Uh, and I suspect there's a few McKinsey people in here. Uh, but uh, in fact, for those of you who are interested, there's a great book that's very fun reading. It's called Future Babel. And it talks about all these market forecasts, all these future forecasts, and it's based on one of my favorite studies, a professor I started tracking about six or eight years ago called Professor Tetlock at UC Berkeley. He's not there anymore. But he followed 28,000 expert forecasts. People like McKinsey and people like Henry Kissinger or Tom Friedman or uh, great, the president of the Royal Society or whoever. 20 years, 28,000 forecasts, average accuracy about the same as, I'm going to use his words, the same as, roughly the same as dart throwing monkeys. That's why you have to discard all that stuff, all those studies, and start doing things, trying things, failing, failing quickly, iterating, learning, and then trying the next thing. That's why entrepreneurs succeed in doing large things and, uh, um, and uh, big entities you don't have to worry about because they like to plan and call McKinsey for a study. Uh, and they don't iterate often enough. They don't change and improve what they're doing. But look, uh, the way and by the way, I, I give a lot of talks and videos, and most of them on our website. So um, I, 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 I've given a couple of talks on exactly that topic, and you can find them. They're normally very long, one-hour talks. Um, um, but uh, you know, feel free if you find them useful to do it. Entrepreneurs have to be obstinate about their vision and flexible about their ta tactics. That means if you give up your long-term vision, you're not going to get there. But nobody on this planet has ever climbed Mount Everest without getting to base camp first. And where the difference between an entrepreneur and a dreamer is dreamers dream about Everest and their mission. Entrepreneurs dream about that and think about uh, base camp. How do they get to a stable place from which they can pursue the larger vision? Um, uh, that's really important. In fact, there was a paper written at INSEAD that's also somewhere on our website about this idea of entrepreneurs don't really plan the long thing, they imagine the long thing, they have that vision, but then they switch all the way back to uh, where they are, and they say, what resources do I have? And I may be able to raise $50,000, what can I do with that 50? What stepping stone I can get to from where I can get, garner some more resources? Hire a better person, get some more money, whatever it is, get a contract. So entrepreneurs start from where they are and look for steps that lead to places that give them more resources and zigzag their way to the eventual goal. And so you have to get to base camp before you get to Mount Everest, and that's how entrepreneurs should think about building a company. Big vision is important, but if you only pursue the big vision, you're likely to fail. Um, the flip side of that, and uh, one I don't like about the VC business, VCs like revenue too much, they like profitability too much. And in the process, they often guide people towards those things, 
and a base camp that's stable. But if base camp doesn't help you plan the route to your vision to Mount Everest, to the peak, you, it's a bad base camp. So it's really important for an entrepreneur to know which base camp to shoot for. Yeah, uh, look, think about it. If you can't afford healthcare, what's your option? Well, yes, you can go to the emergency room in this country. In most parts of the world, there is no emergency room to go to. Um, uh, I'll give you an example that Mayor Bloomberg gave me a few weeks ago. In the US, there's a doctor for every 500 people, roughly of one sort or another. In Tanzania, there's a doctor for every 50,000 people. Th those are the numbers. In Tanzania today, if you need a C-section if you're a woman, or if you get appendicitis, uh, almost certainly you'll die. Unless you're very lucky and have rare access to medical facilities. So what are they doing? They're training high school graduates with a year's worth of training, they can actually do those two procedures. Right? Um, you do the best you can. I personally, it's clearly a problem and it's unfortunate, but it is to the entrepreneur a great opportunity. Somebody who's uninsured, can't afford to go to the doctor, is much more likely to use your mobile app than somebody who has access and easy path. That's why I sometimes say healthcare in India in 20 years may be substantially better than here because people are relying on those systems which are better. And in some sense, the uninsured in this country are the same kind of opportunity. In fact, before Obamacare, I was certain that the uninsured would be where many of these new technologies would emerge because their alternative was much worse than relying on only a mobile phone. And because of that, I think people who do rely on that will end up in the end with better decision-making care than if you go to uh, an experienced 60-year-old specialist with a big ego and medical school from the 50s. There is absolutely opportunity um, at every level. First, um, there is not good advice to the average person available for 401ks. So what does that person do? They're really calling into a talk show to get advice or calling a friend who's equally uninformed. Right? Good systems could absolutely solve that problem. The next thing is, do you have access to the best investors? Well, if you call Morgan Stanley, they're not going to talk to you uh, unless you have a large enough net worth, which is not most people. Uh, but that's maybe the best thing if you know what to do next. Like We have a small company called Quantopia, Quantopian in Boston. The best machine learning people build the best algorithms they can. The company puts the algorithms on your website. All their performance and all its characteristics, when it does well, when it does poorly, is on the website as history of the, of the algorithm. Now, they cut out the middleman so any investor can subscribe. It's like an eBay for wealth uh, investors and an eBay for essentially running an investment fund, except it's done by machine, so they can service anybody and everybody. Again, it's an example where I actually believe uh, five years from now, the people on that website will get much better advice, unbiased by things like fees and other things that affect Morgan Stanley's advice to you. 
And so the people who have less resources will get better advice. They just won't have a human convincing them to spend more money for the human. Um, first, behavioral uh, medicine is a really important area. Um, yeah, I was talking to this company that's doing a wearable device, and I said, you're not in the device business, you're in the behavior modification business. So tell me, and many of you may be doing medical devices, this is a great question to ask. For the average person who wears your device, what two, three, five things every day do they do different? So the product doesn't become the hardware or the gizmo or the software, it's the behavior modification you achieve for some good goal. Reduce your blood sugar. And by the way, uh, the most popular drug for diabetes happens to be Fotomet or Metformin. A better drug, more effective, is a software app called Veldoc. Higher reduction in blood sugar through behavior modification. By the way, also approved by the FDA as a pharmaceutical. In fact, it's the first, to give you a sense of how interesting this world is, it's the first software application ever approved as a pharmaceutical drug by the FDA. Now, they did some silly things because most drugs need refills. You have to get a refill for your mobile app every three months. <laughs> uh, uh, they also, uh, the formulary price was set at $180 a month for this mobile app uh, because that's metformin costs more. Uh, so look, we're making progress. It's not ideal, but we are making progress and behavior is important. Um, there's two ways to approach it, and there's always more than one. You can buck the system and just affect behavior modification. You could go after Jenny Craig with behavior modification easily, and you wouldn't need to worry about partnerships. You could go after Fotomat or Metformin and go through the full FDA process, which Weldoc did, and they did a pretty good job. Um, and there, you have to partner with people who add credibility and you have to run a clinical trial the way you would for a chemical drug. And I think software drugs are going to be very, very common. Almost certainly for mental health, software is going to be a better drug than Valium or uh, pick your favorite. Ritalin, whether they're sort of bordering on wellness, apps or focus apps or real mental disorders or depression, you'll see software apps. You know, um, it's, it's really not that hard if you sort of take the approach that you really don't want to do a business plan. You want to think through the issues and what a business plan is good for is to make sure you're considering all the factors that affect your business. What you really then want is a series of iterations um, um, and, and learning on what is practical and what's not. It depends on your resources also. If you have no resources, then your first things have to generate revenue. If you have $50 million in the bank because you were able to convince some entrepreneur to give it to you, then you might take a slightly longer view. Every circumstance is different, every entrepreneurial team is different, but I would highly recommend the book Lean Startup on how to address that question. Um, You know, for every person, a different app is effective because they're a different person. Uh, I'll give you a trivial example. I love Jawbone. We invested in a long time ago before wearables were fashionable. 
But you know, the thing I like best about it, because I'm in so many meetings, I've said it to Buzz if I haven't walked in an hour and 15 minutes. So four or five hour, times a day, it buzzes. And what I do is walk around the conference room. It achieved a behavior modification for me for that question earlier, that I do not sit very long without moving. And that's really effective. That's actionable. Uh, so depending upon the application, um, you can be really effective. Now, sometimes you can be effective without affecting the consumer. Um, so Ginger IO is a mental health app that collects, so how, how's mental health treated? You go to your psychiatrist, you say, oh, you got bipolar disorder, here's some meds, um, or you got depression, uh, of, mm, manic depressive, here's some meds. Uh, if you can afford $300 a visit, come back next week. If not, come back next month. Um, that's roughly mental health. Um, technically speaking, to give you real data, the latest diagnostic and services manual called DSM-5, which is the Bible for psychiatry, released last year, says that if two different doctors, and I'm gonna oversimplify the statistics to not get too technical, diagnose the same disease with uh, a kappa, which is roughly a correlation coefficient of 0.2. That is, most of the time they come up with different diagnoses, it's still okay. And it's still okay because it results in revenue for the psychiatrist. That's how screwed up medicine is in this country. Um, in fact, Scientific American, to quote them, said, took two of these kappas and said two pitiful kappas is how they describe the new medicine. That's the state of science in psychiatry. What does ginger eye do? Track not once a month for an hour or a half hour, but a few thousand data points a day. It figures out who you call on Thursday evenings. You're probably making plans to go out Friday. It knows when you call your mom. It knows who you email, who you text. It knows if you got out of bed to go to the kitchen, and if you didn't, you probably missed a meal. It tracks thousands of data points a day. Data analysis of that has resulted in hundreds of microbehaviors that do not exist in psychiatric literature that are actually predictive of mental health of a patient. Today, they do something simple. They just call uh, a, a psychiatrist, nurse, and say, this patient is red. Um, that's really interesting. But in the future, they might send you a puppy picture and do some behavioral modification and change the tra trajectory of your maniac depressive episode. Those are the kinds of things that are happening all over. Every area is different. And different people respond to different things. Uh, um, what's uh, the company? There's a good company on weight loss um, that works for a certain percentage of the people. Um, one actionable one, I'll tell you about the coolest. There was a question about what's too wild and versus what's too practical. So I'll give you this company called Think, T-H-Y-N-C. We invested in its craziest idea. But the idea is you pair, put on a pair of headsets, and that stimulates your brain. Uh, electrical stimulates your brain. And you can now take a mobile phone app and say, I want my brain to feel like I just had coffee. And you can dial in coffee. Right? And then you can say, oh, no, I feel like meditation. You can dial in meditation. And the stimulation for about 70% of the people exactly reflects the effect of having coffee or medication. There's some wild stuff out there. It's a lot of fun. And so no idea is too wild if you can find a practical path, as I talked about.
So let me address both those. Um, let me address at least the first question first. What kinds of technologies can have an impact on behavior? Now, let me go back to an area I talked about, right? Advertising. Do you know how much compute power, data analysis, machine learning goes into what the background color of a banner display is or what shape of button gets you more likely to click, right? All that is is hacking the human brain. Hackers hack Windows or, or Android. Advertisers hack the human brain. That's what's going on. Now, they're hacking the brain to sell you something, a pair of jeans you didn't think you needed, um, uh, a coupon for something so you can buy an extra coffee cake that you don't need. There is absolutely no reason the same kind of brain hacking capability cannot be used for behavior modification or changing uh, how you view. The extreme example is you can shock people into hating foods they love. Right? That is a little extreme, but it has been used in cases. Um, but what I'm saying is there's many ways to affect behavior, we all know. Um, and I could talk forever on this issue, so. Look, uh, VCs are human beings. Um, and just like there's good companies and bad companies, good engineers and bad engineers, there's good VCs and bad VCs. Not only that, there's no definition of a good VC or a bad VC. They do different things. Some invest in known things and they do well at it. Others love to do speculative stuff and they do well at it. Um, I don't think it's possible to characterize anybody one way. Um, as to your particular company, um, I don't know your company, Dr. Quigley, but what I would say is if you talk, VC isn't what you know or who you know, most plans do get evaluated fairly. Now, sometimes they're presented so poorly that you don't want to take the time to look at it. And the reason is very simple. If you're going to review on a weekend, 50 plans. You look for signals that the person who gave it to you is thoughtful, that they clear, they think clearly. So you use surrogates, like how it's presented to say, is this worth spending a lot of time on? But I would also say, if you're being rejected, and this is good advice to everybody, think hard about who's rejecting it, try and extract why and learn from that. In fact, don't do this to me, but to other VCs, you can, um, I tell entrepreneurs go, even if you're not looking for money, go submit your plan to see how people, what people critique it for. You're gonna learn something. It's not nice to be critiqued, but it's way more valuable than get, getting attaboys. You know, attaboys make you feel good, critique, helps, gives you a chance to do much better and eliminate risks. So, look at it objectively. Data aggregation will happen. It's a valuable function. Um, and so, I'm glad they put it out. I'm sure Google will put out their version. Uh, others will do that too. Uh, I think in the end, consumers will make a choice. I think some form of data aggregation or federation or affiliation is likely to happen. Uh, the answer again is a wide range. Right? Sometimes there may be no business model, it may be just a technical um, um, innovation that could be significant. We'll often do those. We'll do anything from a $100,000 investment to a $50 million investment. 
a wide range. Uh, the question we look at is how good is the team, how innovative, how open-minded is the team, and what direction do they want to go. Sometimes there's a big technical breakthrough, sometimes there's none. Um, so we see a wide range of things, and probably the most common thing I would say we look for is quality of team and quality of thinking. How do they think about the problem, and how much thought did they put into presenting the problem? Along those lines, what I would say is we are always looking for plans, but we are always looking for great people. We are always hiring in our portfolio, and so Anybody here who wants to send a resume to me, please do. Um, um, a resume, business plan, comment, whatever you like. I, I love getting feedback. So last question of the day, I apologize. Um, let me answer the second question. I think way too many VCs are focused on management fees and not successful companies. But there's enough really great VCs that are focused on the right thing, which is building good successful companies. As to the FDA, uh, I know it can be frustrating sometimes, but what I would say to you is you have to understand their situation. If they make one mistake, it's all over the newspapers, and then somebody gets fired. Right? So their job is to be cautious. Their job is to be a cross-check. Given that, I actually think in this area they're being relatively open-minded. I gave you the example of LDOC, a software app approved as a, uh, as a pharmaceutical drug. I was telling you about the ECG machine in your pocket. The FDA actually approved an ECG machine for over-the-counter without a prescription device. You know, you've got to give kudos to them where it's due. They've been thinking innovatively. They asked the question, what harm could it do? And if the answer was not a lot, then they approved it. And so they, I, I do think they're thinking innovatively about it, but their constraints are very different than what you and I, I might imagine in Silicon Valley. I will take the last question. Oh, okay, great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, the, the, uh, I, I'm gonna have to run, so I apologize if I'm a little rude in running out. But feel free to email me at vk at coastalventures.com. That's the best way to get hold of me. I try and make sure every email gets answered. Thank you all again. <laughs>